Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, September the 18th, 2024. It is currently 11.59 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. If I would have just waited one minute, I could have said good afternoon, and it would have been 12 noon on the dot, right? Wouldn't that have made more sense? Does it even really matter? I just noticed that because I got ready. I, I, I had the iPad laying here, and I was just going to say good afternoon, everyone, but I stopped myself and said good morning, and then I realized it's 11.59 a.m. I, like... How close could I cut that? So do I, good morning, or do I just wait? Do I wait a second here and then I say good afternoon? Does it matter if it's good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night? Does it really matter? Okay, but here we are. I hope you are doing okay today. Have you have you been looking at the news? Have you been keeping up with the news? Have you? Have you have you taken a, a look? Do, do you want to hear some headlines uh, from from today? This is just from today. You want to hear some headlines? Now Hezbollah handheld radios detonate across Lebanon. Now I don't know if you remember yesterday, Hezbollah fighters had these pagers and they all exploded, and what like four thousand people were wounded and injured. It sounds like something from a movie, right? And and Israel seems to be the one that that's being blamed for hacking these pagers, causing them to explode. And, like, just, and, and I, I don't know if you saw the video of it. It's insane. It's like people in a grocery store and all of a sudden, boom, it explodes. The, the, the pagers they have on them. It's just crazy. Well, now today it was handheld radios that detonated. All right. This is the second wave of explosions, less injured because many stopped using devices. So there were fewer people injured today because they're like, hey, I'm not going to use a handheld radio. I'm not using... Uh, I'm not using a pager. I'm not using anything because, well, there, there's obviously, there's a threat here. Uh, this is a, so all of this has led to a spotlight on Israel's cyber warfare unit. Uh, there's a trail of involvement. Uh, okay, and it, go, it goes, it talks about a number of countries. 12 killed, 4,000 injured. Terror group vows a reckoning. So now the terror group, Hezbollah, is like, there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to bas- basically be pay- a payback. All of this is developing. All of these updates are happening. It, it, it literally sounds like something from a movie, but this is happening in real time. Just more chaos and uncertainty are happening in the world in which we live. I saw this headline this morning. You ready for this? The United States deploy soldiers, rockets to Alaska as Moscow military activity ramps up. Well, that makes you get all worried. Okay. America, Russia, World War III. Okay. Now, again, you can, you can, you can exaggerate any of this, but there, there are grave concerns. We could go on. Saudi Arabia will not recognize Israel without Palestinian state. Uh, and then I, I could just, I mean, there's so many articles here of things happening and things going on. And it is all crazy. And it's all insane. And it's all gives you a feeling of uncertainty. It get, we've talked about, uh, we talked about last night, the assassination attempts against the former president, Donald Trump. We've been talking about uh, the, the crazy things being said, bomb threats in Springfield, Ohio, all the, th- just so much. I could just go through a list and it gives you this sense of where is, where is everything headed? Right? Where where are we where where are we going? What is the end of 2024 even going to look like? And can you imagine 2025? It seems to be instability, uncertainty, chaos, confusion, despair, <laughs> discouragement, disillusionment, depression. It just seems like a time of great anxiety. And it and it can definitely feel that way. When you see that the current state is seemingly so volatile, so confusing, so divisive, and it does make you start wondering, well, where are things headed? What's next? And it's very difficult to know where things are headed or what's next. But as Christians, we do believe the Bible outlines those things which are coming 
And we can be certain about those things the Bible does say are coming. Now, there's sometimes disagreements within Christianity about what's going to happen, right? We know that to be very true because of different systems of eschatology, right? Some systems of eschatology, they will go to the, the Old Testament and they will see passages that will speak of certain things and they'll be like, okay, no, 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 that's not Israel. That's not going to be actually going back to the land. No, no, no. This is all referencing the church. And this is being fulfilled right now. Well, the Bible may speak of a millennial kingdom, but we're in the millennium now. It's not an actual thousand years. It basically goes from, you know, the time of of Christ death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to, to the end. Uh, other, others will say, no, most all of the Bible prophecy is already passed, like if they're holding to a more preterist view of eschatology. So you've got more of an amillennial view. You got, then you got the more premillennial dispensational view that believes, no, God has a plan for Israel. Israel will be brought back to the land. They will be restored. As Christians, there's lots of disagreements about exactly what's going to happen, which is really frustrating, but we all believe to some level that the Bible gives us ideas about what's going to happen. Now, we believe, everyone believes that their view of what the Bible says is right, but the main thing is what I want to say. When you look at the culture, there, there's, it's very difficult to make predictions about what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the election, what's going to happen after the election, what's going to become of this movement. and the, what's, there, there's, there's all kinds of just confusion because we really don't know. When it comes to the Bible, at least we believe the scripture is the inerrant inspired word, and we do believe the Bible gives us information about what's to come. The difference is we don't all agree on what it says. That's frustrating because that's just more confusion and more arguing, but I do believe the Bible gives us some idea. Now, for me, my view, even though at one time I was more amillennial, right, I have obviously moved away from my amillennialism, moved away from that, and I believe that for the Bible to truly make any sense, there has to be some understanding that when I'm reading Isaiah and Ezekiel and many of these Old Testament minor and major prophets, that there's prophecies there that I just think I'm not being very, I'm handling the text in a very un, inaccurate way. If I say, well, Israel's not Israel, land isn't land, that this is all going to happen in the church, this is the church, the church, the church, the church, when there's just nothing in the text that should lead me to see the church, I should see who it's about, who it was to, and it's talking about Israel. So I believe for things to really make sense, biblically, and to have any real understanding of the future, we have to see that there are covenant promises made to Israel that have not been fulfilled and they have to be fulfilled literally. And I don't believe they're fulfilled in the church spiritually. I think that that's the only way that anything makes sense. Now, you may have a completely different eschatology, and I understand that because I've had, again, I used to be a millennial and now I've, I reject that. So I understand struggling, trying to figure it out. Hey, look, if it was simple, If it was easy, I know everybody likes to make it sound like it's simple. If it was simple, all Christians would have the same eschatology. If it was easy, we would have one belief about eschatology. Look, we don't even, uh, Christians don't even agree on the word repentance. We don't agree on the word baptism. So, obviously, eschatology is going to have all of these different opinions. I wish it was simple. Because then, then in the midst of chaos, In the midst of being tossed to and fro about what is happening in the present and what's going to happen in the future, we could say, but I can grab on to this. I'm picking up my Bible and I know what is to come. I know this is going to happen and I know this is going to happen and I know it's an absolute certainty. Well, what's frustrating is no Christians can't agree on what those things are going to be, but at least one stream of theology says God is not done with Israel He's going to restore Israel to the land and fulfill many of those promises and those prophecies which we read about in the Old Testament. Now, we have been doing a survey of eschatology. We've been looking at many of those different systems. We've kind of gotten a little sidetracked from it. Hopefully, if everything works out perfectly at church on Sunday, 
hopefully, maybe the first hour, maybe we can get back because we're currently looking at the Davidic covenant and all the promises associated with the Davidic covenant. And we're looking at it from the perspective that God made these promises. These promises are to Israel and they will be fulfilled literally. So we, we, we've kind of already been talking about that. So why am I talking about it this morning? Well, yes, the news is crazy today. So I want to grab onto something that I think, well, I think this is more certain because this comes from the word of God. So I, I didn't know exactly what to talk about. I'm like, do I talk a little bit more about some of the things happening? We talked about the assassination attempts and how Christians should respond. Do I go that direction? So I said, well, I don't know right now. Let me grab and open up the Sermons 2.0 app. I opened up the Sermons 2.0 app and I started going through my feed. I went to the feed tab and guess what I saw when I scrolled down? I took a, it took a little while. This was maybe a couple of days ago, maybe. Um, yeah, this was yesterday. So when I say a couple of days, I subscribe, I, I follow so many broadcasters. My feed is always so just, there's so many messages. So I, I got to yesterday, Tuesday, September the 17th, 2024. And here was the title. Restoration of Israel, part one. And I'm like, well, that I can accomplish a couple of things. First, I can give everyone the information about this message so they go look it up for themselves. So that's that's goal number one. So I, if you have the Sermons 2.0 app, type in Restoration of Israel Part 1. The name of the broadcaster is Now the End Begins Bible Study Archives. What a title for a broadcaster. Now the End Begins Bible Study Archives. Now the end begins. You can look up that broadcaster. Now the end begins. Once you find the broadcaster, look for their message, Restoration of Israel, Part 1. So I want you to find it. I want you to go download it right now. It's only got 22 downloads, 22 streams. We should, I always say we should be able to get that to 100. It doesn't, I'll look at the numbers and realize most people don't actually participate when I tell them to go download and stream because I'm literally looking at the numbers in real time and I'm like, okay, well, I guess nobody's going to go look it up, but go look it up and download it and, and save it. All right. So it'll be ready for you in your library and you can listen to it whenever you want. Right. But now the end begins, study archives, restoration of Israel, part one. So that's the first goal. I just want you to know about it. I want you to go download it. Number two, well, obviously we'll do a little bit of listening to it and we'll do a little bit of review um, and we'll see where it goes, right? So, so the review part, sometimes I make that the number one goal because we're going to review all of it. This case, I just want to see where they go. Maybe I'm probably going to listen to, I don't know how many parts they're going to do, but I'm going to definitely want to listen and hear their perspective. Now, let me state this clearly. Now the end begins Bible study. You've heard me play a little bit of their programming. And I was very critical because I disagreed with everything they said, because I thought in many cases it was just crazy, over the top, conspiratorial insanity. All right. But guess what? I still follow them because even though I may criticize and even though I may disagree, I usually continue to listen so I can continue to be challenged, maybe frustrated and irritated by different perspectives so that I can continue to have my perspectives challenged. So they're talking about the restoration of Israel. Will I agree with everything they say? Probably not. Am I asking you to agree with everything they say? Absolutely not. I am definitely not. I'm definitely not telling you to agree with everything. Okay. I'm telling you to listen, to think, to look up, to check. But I want us to take a little journey here and see how far we can get. All right. The restoration of Israel. The world right now, it's just crazy. I mean, it's so, so much is happening. I could probably just sit here all day going because I subscribe to so many news podcasts and just spend all day just listening to one one news uh, podcast after another, uh, another after another after another. I listen to many that are updated every hour on the hour. And I could just, and by the time, if I just started writing things in a notebook, after a couple of hours, I may just throw the pencil down and say, the world is coming to an end. So you don't want to, you don't want to slide into that. So sometimes like, what can we grab on to? Well, last night we talked a little bit about remembering uh, you know, the sovereignty of God 
grabbing on to peace and not buying into fear or panic, right? So you don't, we don't want our looking at the world to turn into fear, anxiety, worry, depression, discouragement, disillusionment, anger, wherever it could lead. What we want it to do is like, man, the world is a mess. The world is on fire. Like if, even if we wanted to use that kind of language, the world is just absolutely seeming to be tossed to and fro. I need to find some solid ground. Well, I'll open up my Bible and go, okay, what does the Bible say about what's going to happen next? Let's just, now we don't want to make, we don't want to force the Bible to be saying something it doesn't actually say, but we want to find those things that seem to be relatively certain. And then we can grab onto that. Now, again, I know your system of eschatology. If you're a preterist, you believe most Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled. It's all past. If you're an amillennialist, you believe a lot of the uh, future, the, the prophecies are being fulfilled inside the church. And if you are maybe more dispensational in your approach, premillennial dispensational type, type I'm, not, I'm not using every little dis, you know, identifier, I'm just trying to summarize these, then you're going to look for some type of very future events that you feel have not been fulfilled yet, and they will be fulfilled literally. And a large number of those promises deal with the nation of Israel specifically. And the nation of Israel is constantly in the news. All right. So let's learn about the restoration of Israel part one. This is how long. Um, It's one hour and 16 minutes and 58 seconds. If I was to review all of this, it would probably take us, and I am not even exaggerating, probably close to 10 hours. So obviously I'm not going to review all of it. I'm going to start the review and then stop it. I may then listen to more on my own. And of course, if you listen to something, you're like that, hey, at the 49 minute mark, he says this, please review that. What do you think about that? That That's always helpful because then I can just go to that part. But I want you to go listen to all of it. All right. I don't know if you, if you're using the sermons 2.0 app, follow now the end begins Bible study archive. So you'll have part two in your feed the minute it drops. Now, if you listen to their other content, some of it is very conspiratorial. I think just, I think just crazy misinformation, disinformation. I, I would, I would have some issues with it, but I like you to hear all different perspectives as well. So are you ready? Here we go. I have my Bible in hand. I don't have any of my notes from what we've been doing on eschatology because we're currently looking at the Davidic covenant. But so I'm, I'm not going to bring that. I'm not going to connect that to this, but I'm ready to go. Are you ready? Right? Yeah. Okay. Finally, someone said, I was waiting for someone to say they were ready. All right, here we go. Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Grider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. All right. In their introduction, they kind of give us everything we need to know. They're KJV only, and they're dispensational. So clearly why they're doing a program on the restoration of Israel makes sense because they're dispensational and dispensationalists believe in a future restoration of the nation of Israel, where those promises in the Old Testament will be literally fulfilled, not in the church, but to the nation of Israel. That's a very important distinction. So right there tells me everything. I know exactly which way they're going. They're dispensational. They're KJV only. Obviously, I'm very familiar with that world, right? Most many of the Bible colleges and seminaries I graduated from were dispensational and KJV only. So obviously I, I know that world very well, even though I, 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 I became an amillennialist, uh, even though I went to those kinds of schools. Uh, so that's kind of funny how I, I was going to schools that weren't amillennial and I became amillennial. And then after leaving those schools, then I kind of became back. I went back to dispensational. Yeah, because while I'm always, look, I'm willing to change my view right now on everything because none of us really, we, whatever truth we think we hold today, there's a high probability that we're wrong because we are fallible human beings. And clearly after 2000 years, Christians still don't understand scripture. 
right? Or we can say we don't agree on anything in Scripture. And if we don't agree on anything, that's a high probability we don't really understand as much as we think. But let's see where they're going to go. Here we go. And good evening, everybody. Happy Tuesday and welcome to the program. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight, for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight, we start a brand new series, The Coming Restoration of Israel, Part 1, The Throne of David. In our day, Israel is a constantly maligned nation, the Jews are in a perpetual persecution, and Zionism is a proverb and a byword, exactly as your King James Bible says that it will be in the last days. But as Paul Harvey used to say, now for the rest of the story, and what a story it is. Welcome to our brand new Rightly Dividing Bible series on the coming restoration of Israel. Now, this is a question. I do it. All pastors do it. When we make references, like pop culture references, like he made a Paul Harvey reference, right? Now, there are are those listening probably never heard Paul Harvey, probably have no idea who Paul Harvey was, what he did. Was it a radio program, TV show? What was it? You may not even have a clue. So it's always interesting as communicators, podcasters, pastors, on one hand, it's easy to make references to things that were a part of your life, right? You can make references to things that was a part of your life, but there, your audience may get, get it or not get it. So should, should, should pastors only use references that are more modern, more up to date, because you know the audience, everyone in the audience should be able to get it, Right? Because it's relevant, it's, 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 it's current, or do you feel it's okay to make an old reference if you explain what the old reference is, if you explain something about it, or does it matter? I don't know. I'll make a reference and I'll be like, well, this dates me, this dates me. And so sometimes I'll be like, well, that's, ah, oh, maybe I should use a more current reference, right? So I, I don't know. I, I, Paul Harvey, that's a pretty dated reference. That's a very dated reference, right? If you don't know, Paul Harvey was a like a radio program. Um, I remember when I was very little, very little, we would take my father lunch, right? We would meet him before his lunch hour and we'd bring him something to eat and he'd sit in the car and they would listen to Paul Harvey, right? And he would talk about current events or something and he would kind of say, this is going on now for the rest of the story. And then so I, I don't remember everything about the Paul Harvey program. I just remember listening to a little bit. So even for me, other than than that, I don't know. Like I would hear Paul Harvey mentioned, but it's not like I was a bit, I, I wasn't like a Paul Harvey listener or anything because other than that, I think after that, I don't, I, I never tuned in or, or heard, maybe, maybe, I, I, yeah, I don't think I ever listened to him on my own. So it was maybe even a little, I mean, I, I was alive, but it was almost a little bit before my time, if that makes any sense, as I got older and yeah, I, I, I moved on. So, but I know who he is. So it's always like, I don't know. How, how do you, what references do you use when, you know, that's things a communicator has to make decisions on. And a lot of times it's just impromptu. You just, I, a lot of times my references are not because I thought them through. It's just what comes to my mind in the middle of communicating. You watch before this is over, I'll probably make some reference that once again would be like, why is he making that reference? That's outdated. There's, there's a possibility. Luke chapter one, verses 32 and 33. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Your Bible has a lot to say about the day when the Jews will be back on top, when Messiah Jesus will rule and reign on the throne of David from the literal, visible, and physical kingdom of heaven that is Israel in general and Jerusalem in particular. In part one of our new series, we explore the Old and New Testament verses that show you the rule of King Jesus over the kingdom 
that was prepared for him from before the foundation of the world. It will be the most amazing nation that has ever existed, and the Jews will, once again, take center stage as the keepers of the oracles of God. Tonight we watch as Jesus takes the throne of David, and as he does, dozens and dozens of long-awaited prophetic Bible verses fire off all at once. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for waking us up today. We thank you, Lord, for the food on the table, the clothes on our back, and the roof over our head. We thank you for an amazing camp meeting weekend. And Lord, we commit this time to you, and we ask you to lead us and guide us into all truth through the power of your Holy Spirit, and we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it, Lord, for you are worthy. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Everyone knew, if you've listened to me, that I was going to come in right there. You know. You know what I disagree with, right? You know what I 100% disagree with? Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is not leading and guiding us into all truth. He is not doing that, ladies and gentlemen. Any rational person should be able to understand that. If he's leading and guiding us into all truth, then we should all agree on this. We should have the same doctrine, same theology. There should be complete unity and complete agreement within Christianity. He can't be leading and guiding the Baptist into one view of baptism while he's leading and guiding the Presbyterians into a different view of baptism. And he's leading the Lutherans into a different view of baptism. And he's leading the charismatics to certain view. And he's leading non-charismatics. No, that's not the way it works. He's not leading. If he's leading and guiding, there would be unity. There's no unity. So how does it work? We as individuals have been given God's revelation in a written form. And now we have to figure it out the way you figure out anything that's in a written form. We have to utilize interpretive principles and interpretive concepts, right? We got to know context, syntax. We got to know definition of words, Greek, Hebrew. We got to know all of these basic principles. And then it's our job to try to be consistent in those principles and arrive at a conclusion. If the spirit is guiding and leading, do you, you don't even understand the ramifications of that. If I tell you I was studying my Bible and the Holy Spirit led and guided me to this interpretation, then by definition, my interpretation would be infallible because it came from God. So you could not question me or challenge me. So if you send me one of your emails, I would be like, well, my interpretation came from God. You can't question me. Well, then you could argue, well, God led me to my interpretation. You can't question me. Well, someone is not being led by God. So I disagree with that outrightly, full blown. No, I have no, I, I have no give in that area. I used to teach that. Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. You look around and go, but see, you you realize where the inevitable conclusion will be. Well, I guess he only leads and guides me. See, because whatever I think comes from God, therefore I'm right. And those who people who don't come to the same conclusion as I do is not being led and guided by God or the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they're not saved. You see how inevitably crazy? That's where cults get formed. He's given us his word in written form. He led and guided the authors of the New Testament into all truth. He brought to their memory those things that he had said. Those are promises for the original apostles, disciples, and the authors of the New Testament, not for us. Welcome to the program, everybody. Glad that you're here. I got so much really good feedback from our four-part series entitled, From the Pre-Tribulation Rapture of the Church to the End of the World. So I thought it would be a good idea to do another multi-part series, this time on the restoration of the nation of Israel. Let me tell all listeners, the power of a listener, when you give positive feedback, when you speak up, the positive, 
you almost inevitably will change the direction of a program, right? Like, hey, we got so much positive feedback that I was like, we're going to continue. We're going to do something similar because once you get that positive feedback, you're like, this is the, I'm going to continue to follow this path because, well, you want people listening. You want that positive feedback, right? So, um, yeah, p- listeners don't understand the role they play. Little encouragement, a little bit of just feedback of any kind. You're like, okay, good. Someone's out there listening. I know it, it's like, you're like, but I'm busy. I got a life to live. I know that. I'm just saying you don't understand the impact you can give with a little bit of positive feedback and just a little bit of feedback of any kind, any kind of just anything. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Israel is in the news every single day, and we're going to talk about the news um, that Israel is making today. And uh, war is is regional war, a big war, is very, very close to breaking out in the Middle East, in Israel, in Lebanon, in Iran, in Iraq, and all those other places. And as we watch all these things bumping and colliding with each other, Your King James Bible is crystal clear. The day is coming when Israel is going to be restored. The Jews will once again be in a right relationship with God. And the entire world is going to come to Jerusalem and Israel. It's going to be the capital of the universe. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Okay, a couple of things. First of all, when he says the the Bible is crystal clear, let me make it very clear. If it was crystal clear then there wouldn't be all of the disagreements and all the fighting and all the arguing. So it's not crystal clear. I just, I I know that's a major doctrinal emphasis within the Protestant world. Baptists, even Baptists who say, well, we're not Protestants. Uh, Okay, you can argue about the title given to you. All non-Catholics love to say, the Bible is crystal clear. It is easily understood, at least in, in these areas. There may be things in it that are difficult, but for the most part, the Bible is easily understood. That is a constant non-Catholic view. And the reason why that is so much built into the DNA of not the non-Catholic Christianity is because we argue we don't need a magisterial authority. We don't need the church to give us the interpretation. Anyone can read and interpret most of the Bible. Oh, there's some parts that are difficult, but for the most part, we can understand it. That it, because we, we reject the need for a magisterial authority. We say we can understand the Bible, but 2,000 years of, of you know, or, or if, you, if you even go from the Protestant Reformation on, from 1517 on, well, if it was so crystal clear, this group d- decided to disagree with this group, and this group disagreed with this group, and we split, and we split, and we split, and this denomination, and this denomination, and this interpretation, and this system of theology, and it grew, and it grew, and now there is just no agreement on anything. So it's not crystal clear. I just completely reject that concept. If it was clear and it was clarity, there would be unity and agreement. All right. So, but I do love the passage he read. And I, and I, the verse that jumped out at me this time, I know a lot of people, and and we'll look at Romans 11, look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. Here's what I love about it. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them. This is my covenant unto them. The them is Israel who, when I shall take away their sins, the them and their, the them and their by some would be, oh, that's the church. And I will say that them and their is Israel. 
not the church. That, that's very important. All right, let's see where, he, where else he goes with this. One of the reasons why we sell every single book that Clarence Larkin ever wrote is because when you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, there were a lot of people writing Bible commentaries. There were a lot of people that had an opinion on a lot of things. But when I investigated, you know what I found? I found that Clarence Larkin virtually stood alone, stood by himself in his belief that the Jews were going to be restored to the nation of Israel and that Israel would once again become a nation. Very, very few other Bible commentators in that time period believed in the restoration of Israel. And on tonight's Bible study, we're going to talk about how May 14th, 1948 was not the regathering of the nation of Israel. It was a regathering in order for them to fulfill the prophecies related to their final dispersion. And I know that's a little hard to wrap your, your head around. Because basically, when you understand what I'm saying, Israel was regathered in 1948 to be scattered in the time of Jacob's trouble. Regathered to be scattered. And... Um, that's really what the Bible teaches. There's no other way around it. That's an interesting concept. That when they came back in 1948, they only were regathered so they could be scattered again. That's an, an interesting concept. We'll have to do some more work on it. If you don't know anything about Clarence Larkin, he, his, he lived from 1850 to 1924. 1850 to 1924. Why is this so important because his views about Israel was happening when, well, Israel as a nation didn't exist. They don't become a nation again until 1948. So, and, and again, and I, whenever you look at church history, a lot of what the church fathers would say and a lot of people would say about Israel at the time and why many would look towards the church as the fulfillment is because Israel was gone. 70 AD, Israel's wiped off the face of the earth. So if you're looking at passages of scripture that seems to be talking about Israel, well, what are we going to do? There's no Israel. It's gone. There's no, it, what are we going to? Oh, the church. It made perfect sense to look for the church as, in a sense, a replacement because Israel wasn't around. So for the fact that Clarence Larkin and, and others, especially those early dispensationalists, many they didn't start changing their view after 1948. Many of them were pr putting forth the concept before 1948. I think that that's very much, very much needs to be understood. And they, in many cases, virtually stood alone because uh, the more all millennial type view would have been much more prominent as, as throughout a good portion of church history. There's no way to get around that. All the all millennial view, you can understand 70 AD, Israel's gone. So what do we do when we see Israel, 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 Israel? Well, we got to. It's the church because the church is visible. We can see the church. Okay, there we go. And, and so we'll say that this land doesn't mean land. This doesn't mean this. This doesn't mean this. This doesn't mean when it says I'm going to make a covenant. I, I'm making a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house, house of Judah. Uh, no, 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 no. We, 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 we will, we will say that that's spiritual Israel. And, and so you can understand all of the reasoning for it. But Clarence Larkin, well, took a different approach. He was a prominent. American Baptist pastor and writer known for his works on biblical prophecy and, are you ready for it, dispensationalism. His most famous work is Dispensational Truth, also known as God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages. It was published in 1918. This book became influential within Christian eschatology and is widely regarded for its detailed charts and visual aids that illustrate biblical prophecy and the dispensational timeline. Again, the name of the book, it's his most famous, Dispensational Truth. It's also known as God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages. Now, yes, 
all the dispensational charts. Amillennialists love to make fun of those charts. They love to mock them. I've even made fun and mocked them because you have to have a chart for everything. I understand that. But if you'll just look past the charts and, and any of the mockery that may be thrown at it, you know, maybe you, even if you're not dispensationalist, you should at least read the book and appreciate that he's do, saying these things in 1918. That's pretty awesome to me. Again, the name of the book, I, I haven't looked it up currently to see where it's available. I'm assuming it's available on uh, at Amazon and probably available on the Kindle for relatively cheap. Um, but it's uh, his the name of the book, Dispensational Truth, also known as God's Plan and Purpose in the Ages. All right. Um, he, uh, he authored several other books, including the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, I guess commentaries, which further explores prophecy and end time themes. And then, well, there we go. So, so that's Larkin. And so they sell every one of his books. So obviously you can look at their website and find it through them. You can probably find it through Amazon as well. And then you can get kind of a, a, a again, just from a, his, even again, even if you res, you despise dispensationalism, you should want to read the book just because it was so influential in an entire stream or, or, or eschatological system that has been very prominent at, well, throughout a good portion of well, modern day church history. From, well, from around 19, from the, or about the early, mid, mid night, well, early 1900s all the way till well, 2024. It's still a very prominent system of eschatology. All those prophecies in Matthew and Mark and Luke about the time of Jacob's trouble and the Great Tribulation and the Jews being scattered, all those prophecies are yet future. So May 14th, 1948 could not possibly have been the final regathering. There's only two times anywhere in the Bible that God talks about Israel being regathered. The first time they were regathered after the 70-year Babylonian captivity. The second time that they're going to be regathered is going to be at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble at the second advent. And when that happens, King Jesus from Revelation 19 is going to mount up on a white horse and all of us who were saved are going to mount up on white horses behind him and we're going to return and the king is going to bring in the kingdom. And it is going to be the most momentous time in human history. Now, I completely agree. 1948 was not a fulfillment of any of, of the prophecy about being regathering. It was a foreshadowing of, maybe. It was like a, this is a hint of what is to come, right? But it was nowhere close. I mean, you read Ezekiel and and again, the, the regathering is connected to the new covenant. That, that's why whenever people talk about the new covenant, new covenant was made with Israel. That's who it was made with. We're grafted in to the spiritual promises of it. But those promises to Israel, a part of the new covenant, have never been fulfilled. And I'm not going to spiritualize them and steal them from the people they were originally given to. So, uh, so I agree with him. 1948 was not a fulfillment of these uh, promises that you when that you read because you read these passages and you're like whoa nothing like that has ever happened so then you've got to start spiritualizing it to death and I just that's where I have a problem and tonight in part one we are going to primarily focus on the throne of David Old Testament scripture New Testament scripture and everything that these Bible verses are pointing to. And I hope that it will be a blessing for you. We're so glad that you're here with us tonight. O daughters of Zion. O okay, I did not realize there was music. <laughs> All right, I wasn't expecting that. That caught me off guard. All right, so I'm going to turn this way down. I'm turning this way down. All right. Ah, 
I want to try to fast forward it, but I'll end up going way past it. The the ability to skip ahead on my uh, studio software is not the best. It doesn't have a little button that's like, you know, five minutes, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. It doesn't have that at all. So we will we will get back to this. Hang on. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm just going to let it play. It can't be that long, hopefully. So we will see here. We will see here. Yeah, we'll let it play. So, but at, when we, whenever we investigate these types of things and study these types of things, it's just important to realize how much disagreement there is within the Christian world on issues of eschatology. There, there's major disagreements in these areas. And I wish, I know, I know we love within the Christian world to have this mindset that it's so simple, it's so easy. You know, because because here's what happens when, when you go to church, the way it's taught is you, the system is taught. And then you're given the system. The system is a placed upon the Bible. And, you're like, and then you, it's like, well, see, that's what the Bible teaches. Well, you're really just reading the Bible through the lens of the system. And what we need to do is get to the text and see where the text leads us. And it's hard to get pe- Christians to do that because they just want to be taught a system, very simple, very authoritative and dogmatic, and then just say, that's what I believe. But no one system is perfect. Let's just make that very clear. There, there's issues with all of them. And anyone who denies that is just not being fair. There's, there's, there's difficulties. There's difficulties with all of them. Even with some, there's dispensational ideas that I'll be like, oh, I don't, see, that's why I say you don't have to be identified by a system. The systems are there and you can go from the systems and say, okay, what are you, what are you saying? Okay. But I'm not bound to it. The system is not my magisterial authority where I, and I have to, well, what, 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 what do you believe? I, I, people want you to be identified. They want to be able to put you in a category. You're a dispensationalist. You're a non-millennialist. How about I'm just, I don't know, someone trying to figure out the Bible and yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's things about dispensationalism. I'm much more dispensational. There may be things that I disagree with dispensationalists on outright, but I don't really care who gets offended. Now, that's not, that's great for being a podcaster. Let me tell you, it's not great doing that as a church. Okay. <laughs> I know. Because people are just going to leave and they're going to go find a church that agrees with their system. They just want a system. They don't, they don't, they want to be taught theology. They don't want to do theology. These are issues I talk about constantly. I wonder, I, I hope this program, um, I hope they have copyright. Uh, I hope they have rights to play that music. I hope they do. I'm assuming they do. Many, many Christian podcasters just think that they can just grab something and play it. And it's like, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And, and you say, well, you're, you're reviewing. Because, well, fair use allows me to review for critique and and analysis and educational purposes. So, but when it comes to music, man, there's very little, you can't do much with that. The, the music copyright laws are crazy. So, and, 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 I, and I don't disagree with them because the artists should have their music protected. But I, I just, sometimes I'll listen to these Christian podcasters. I'm like, do they have rights to play that? I'm just going to say they do, but I don't. So I'm not playing it. I think this is fast coming to an end. I apologize for this. It caught me off guard. I wasn't ready. See, this is what happens when you review things without listening to it first. But typically, we don't hear music in what we're reviewing, right? Or it's at the beginning, and, and we just start the review at the uh, at the end of the music. This caught me a little off guard. Okay, here we go. Wait, they're going to play more? All right, they're making this very difficult on me. Come on now. I'm trying my best. I'm trying to do a good review here. Come on, help me out. I'd rather have Jesus than silver. I wonder if they have the rights to all of this. If they do, I wonder, you got to pay a certain amount. Like, I wonder, like, that's just, I, I want to fast forward it, but I'm afraid I'll mess it up. I'm afraid I'll mess it up. I kind of fast forwarded a little bit. You didn't hear that. So hopefully I'm a little bit closer. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay, well, this is this is causing a little delay, but I don't want to I don't want to just keep messing it around because the Spreaker software has had some you know issues, and so if I feel like I keep moving it around, I'm going to get that little will of death, and then everything's going to crash, and I'm not and I lose everything. So I would rather just have to go through a little bit of this, but yeah, we will see. We will see. But yeah, as I as I was saying. That's one of the difficult difficult things dealing with many Christians is the church really, I don't think, can ever truly be the the source of theological and biblical education as it should be, because what many Christians want, they don't want to be challenged. They just want they just want say, here's what we our system believes, and just teach me just teach me the system. They don't want to be forced in the uncomfortable position of doing theology. Just teach me it. And if I disagree, now I'll just leave anyway, but just teach me it. Now, as long as you stay within the agreed upon parameters, then okay. But if you go outside these agreed upon parameters, I'm just going to leave. They don't want to just be there to be struggle through things and work and try to figure it out and maybe be in a place where there's a little disagreement. They don't want that. They want to only hear what they want to hear and they will not tolerate anything else. And it's like, uh, there's no way to actually then do theology that way. Because do theology, you're questioning, you're challenging, you're creating hypotheses. I'm going to try to fast forward just a little bit. Maybe they're getting close to the end now. Here we go. They got to be done. They got to be done. They got to be done. Here we go. Let's hope. Let's hope. Here we go. Okay, maybe not. We're, we're, I'm just going to fast forward this again. Where, where is? How much music do they play in this? All right, hang on. Let let's let's see now. Is is this it? No. All right. Let's see if I can go here. Wow. That is crazy. All right. Here we go. Now that's how about this. Let it. Wow, this is like a full-blown music program. I wonder I wonder if they got copyright for all of Grace, this. Grace, Micah, and... Okay, here we go. Now we can back it up a little bit. Now we can back it up a little bit. Spoken request. Okay. I think this is the end. I think this is the end. I apologize for all of that. And that took minutes of our time. All right, here we go. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and we pray for lost souls. Adam's wife, Shanna, Lori B. Shira Shine says, please pray for the salvation of my children, Scott, Sherry, and Nicole, as well as Kevin, Michelle, Lewis, and Joshua Blake. Lori Ann's grandfather, Irvin, Mark Fennell. Kevin Thompson, praying for his dad, Tim, to get saved. Elga. Rob is praying for his... Do you like the idea of saying people's names live on the air? I'm not a fan of that. Some lost person stumbles upon it. Like, why is my name on a broadcast? Like, how dare? Like, I don't know about that. I, I, uh, I struggle with that. I don't know about that. All right, but let's continue. Three children, Max, Olivia, and Mikey. Phyllis T is praying for her husband. Captain Brian A. Robbins needs to be saved. Todd Broom's brother, Thad. Marie's friends, family, Ashley, Dayton, Alyssa, Kyle, Brandon, Grace, Micah, and Macy. Adam and Katie praying for parents, sisters, and other family members. Ellen praying for grandsons, Braden and Logan. His Grace is praying for Rob, Summer, Sue, and Mike, 
<clears throat> Carl, Jason, and Rachel, and Jason and Carrie. Lola's son, William, and wife, Lindsay. Hannah's mom, Anja, praying for Hanu, John Charles, and Anna Lilsa. Dave Evans for his friend Taylor, Viviana for her brother Javier Reyes, Adam and Katie for their neighbors Jason, Eddie, and Brian, Jane for her son Troy, Julie Lynn for her friend Katie Ann, and Rita in Colorado praying for her son Dan. People who need a healing today. Pastor James Knox is dealing with prostate cancer and we are praying for him. Pastor George needs prayer for cancer of the tongue as well as pancreatic cancer. He'll be having surgery on his tongue this week. Aaron Williams fell off of a ladder at work and broke four ribs. Uh, He says, please pray for the pain. Marilyn Wilson has a compressed disc and a pinched nerve. Sandy, um, shoulder surgery and um, a number of things. <clears throat> that are going on with the blood flow to her shoulder bones. Mike Fleming just turned 70, diagnosed with liver cancer, given six months to live. He is refusing treatment and will spend that time by faith. That's something you don't see every day. Pray for Mike and his wife, Nancy. Uh, we we have supplied Mike many times in the past couple of years with Bibles through the, through the free Bible program. And uh, he really needs your prayer. Cheryl M. Friend Gordon was trampled by cattle, 85 years old, in intensive care. Uh, Marie Sims' husband, only given a few months to live. Daniel has shingles. Wes and Debbie, the Lord knows the need. Pray for them. Nihal Pereira, wife Shandrika, stage four cancer. Lulu, please add my sister's friend Charlene to the list. She has liver cancer and is not saved. Sandy, uh, what we already prayed for Sandy. Uh, Jen, for God to lift my grief and replace it with his strength. For salvation for my family and reconciliation with my daughter. Heather, Lyme disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Amanda Ward has cervical cancer, and we're praying for her and her husband, Jeff. Amber, for a complete healing, peace, and sobriety. Angela, please pray for sister-in-law, Gail, with stage 4 kidney disease, and for brother Larry to get saved. Linda's sister, Mary Ann, rheumatoid arthritis, Asher from my mom. Kevin Thompson going through a mold poisoning lawsuit. Please pray for that for a good outcome. Stephanie, husband Andy's battle with alcohol. and Okay, I'm going to try to fast forward this a little bit. I did not know a good portion of this is, is this. All right, so let's continue. For her daughter, Norcha. Uh, Berta and Mike Crabb, um, April of 2025. Mark Saxa would like prayer for his son Joseph to return. Needs to find a place to live and would in small. We ask you to answer them according to your will, your way, in your time. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad that you are here tonight. And tonight we start our brand new Bible series on the coming restoration of the nation of Israel. And we're going to talk a lot tonight about that. And just like Clarence Larkin back in 1917, when he wrote Dispensational Truth, took a very bold stand, and he said, according to the scripture, Israel is absolutely going to be regathered, And it's going to happen sooner rather than later. I thought the book was 1918. So whether it's 1917 or 1918, you can look and see which date is correct. I thought it was 1918. So I, I could have been wrong. All right. So let's continue. Clarence Larkin died in 1934. 14 years later, Israel would be regathered 
as a nation for the first time in 2,000 years. And so tonight we are going to look at the amazing future restoration of the nation of Israel. Before we get started, I received a letter today from NTE beer Emily, and uh, this is what she wrote. I wanted to write to thank you for your radio Bible ministry. I have been listening to you for about two years now. I feel that I am learning so much. Amen. I homeschool my two boys, ages six to eight. We started studying the Old Testament using um, Apologia's textbook. During the reading of a psalm, I read the, the word Selah at the end. My boys were coloring as I was reading, and my little six-year-old asked what Selah meant. I smiled because thanks to you, I knew the answer. I know you guys are enjoying the new bookstore. I will be looking to see what you might have for the little ones. And uh, we have a brand new, greatly expanded selection of books for young readers and for little kids. And um, uh, we hope that that will be a blessing to you. But I wanted to read that letter just to remind you of the importance and the necessity of daily Bible study. We have been doing these twice a week Bible study programs. Now I will circle this back around to kind of what we were talking about the other day, right? We were, I'm talking about like, we were talking about AI and technological advancements. And well, this is, this is the technological advancement of Christian radio or Christian podcasting, right? And so I, I said, as, as these things continue to happen, it calls into question the church, right? I talked about how I was basically discipled, not in the church, but outside the church, Christian radio. So what does the church actually bring to the table? Well, here is a woman writing a radio ministry saying, hey, I knew the word what Selah meant, not from her church, from radio. <laughs> like that's like, that is like... How do we, I, I still don't know how to process that, right? I still struggle with that. Like the, I, the people with a microphone in many cases do more than an entire church building and all the money and effort and, and resources that go in to keep it operating. How do you, I, 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 I struggle with how to process that, but okay. All right. Let, let's continue. I we're already at an hour. We didn't get anywhere. So I'm a little, remember goal number one was just to tell you about this. Goal number two was to do somewhat of a review. So I'm going to be very frustrated when this is over, but I at least accomplished goal number one. Don't forget goal number one, because we're not getting anywhere close to goal number two, but I'm going to go a little longer till we can get maybe at least one something about the ultimate topic here. For 13 years, 13 years now. And uh, recently, we just passed our 2,000th episode. And that's a lot of talk (laughs) about the Bible. That's a lot of study into the scripture. And I love when we get letters like that. um, When Just think, over 2,000 episodes... And what did they say? I can't remember how many years they said. We here at the Theology Central uh, podcast, we're over 4,000 episodes, over 4,000. And we've done it in about five years, maybe about uh, five, six years as uh, over those 4,000 episodes. If you bring everything together from all the different things that we've done, some of them are where there was different feeds and different, you know, uh, RSS feeds, but if you bring it all together, yeah, about 4,000 episodes. So just please just consider how much uh, over 2000 for them over 4,000 for us. Just think of how many hours of content that is just, just from two broadcasters. That would be over 6,000 episodes from two broadcasters over six thousand episodes that at a minimum that's over six thousand hours at a minimum a minimum of six thousand hours of content like 
And I guarantee you both of those were done way cheaper than it would be for any church to operate. Way cheaper than for any church to operate. Like that's how, how do we deal with that? People reach out to say, hey, your Bible studies mean so much to me and they're really helping me. They're helping um, uh, our kids. They're helping our family. And um, uh, we are so very appreciative when you guys take the time to write and to tell us how much that you enjoy these Bible studies. And uh, everything that we do here is geared towards teaching people about the Bible. What does it say? What is Bible doctrine all about? What does rightly dividing mean? And all these other things and topics that we talk about over the last 13 years. Bible study. You need to do more Bible study in your daily life than any other one single thing that you do. Now, I know that's a very hard goal to reach, and I don't always reach that goal myself, but it remains the goal. Tonight, we start a brand new series on the restoration of the nation of Israel. Dr. Ruckman has a little booklet that we sell. Oh, no. Oh, no. Dr. Ruckman? Is that Peter Ruckman? Oh, no, 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 no. No, that cannot be Peter Ruckman. That cannot be Peter Ruckman. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Uh... Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Ruckmanism. I look what, oh, man, we could get into a whole discussion. They sell something by Peter Ruckman? That is crazy. Oh, man. I, we could get into a whole discussion about Peter Ruckman. Okay. All right. I hope it's not Peter Ruckman. I hope it's a different Ruckman. Hopefully it's not anything to do with Ruckman. Uh, oh, the Ruckmanite views. Oh, man. Because those are majorly problematic, ladies and gentlemen. Majorly problematic. One of the wonderful things about doing these reviews is I never know what's going to happen. That's the fun part. You can see some of the di the, the frustrating part is we just, all this has been a little kind of messed up. But man, I was not expecting to hear Peter Ruckman's name. Oh wow! Okay, let's what? Let's see what booklet he's referencing. Let's see what book he's refer referencing. It's not expensive. It's like five fifty for the booklet, and it's called "The Restoration of Israel," and it's really just six messages that he gave on the physical and spiritual restoration promised to the nation of Israel in the Scriptures. And we live in a day and age where Christians struggle to understand what the nation of Israel is all about, where Christians put themselves into the time of Jacob's trouble because they don't understand what the time of Jacob's trouble is. If you knew what the time of Jacob's trouble was, you would never, as a Christian, put yourself there because you don't belong there. Here's what I would say. If you want to know about the restoration of Israel, what I would say is take your Bible and just start looking, going through, skimming, and looking for verses about promises that seem to be to Israel, and just ask yourself, has that ever been fulfilled? And then say, is that going to be fulfilled for the nation of Israel? Or do I spiritualize that and say it's the church? Uh, you, you don't need a Ruckman. But if you want to find Ruckman's uh, little booklet uh, and on the restoration of Israel, by all means, you can look for it. Just realize Peter Ruckman had some very, very false and damaging and almost bordal. I, 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 won't, I won't say go beyond that. Just some really not good things. And so, yeah, well, 
we, we, he, he was much more prominent in the independent fundamental King, King James only world. And then even many within that world was like, whoa, no, 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 no. We're not a Ruckmanite. We do not believe in Ruckmanism. We do, we re- reject his view. And so, uh, but I, I felt, I felt that he'd kind of like no longer was relevant. It's hard. It's crazy to hear a program in 2024 promoting something of, of Peter Ruckman. That's, that's really ca- catching me off guard. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We just finished a four-part series entitled From the Pre-Tribulation Rapture of the Church to the End of the World. If you haven't listened to that series, we strongly urge you to take the time and go listen to all eight hours of that series And understand what the Bible has to say from the event known as the pre-tribulation rapture of the church all the way to the end of the world going into eternity. Tonight we start our four, well, I don't, I almost said four part series. I don't know how many parts, maybe it's just going to be two or three. Maybe it will be five or six. Remember about six or seven years ago? We did like a 15-part series on the book of Isaiah. And some of you have been around long enough, you remember that series. And um, I do love a good series, and that gives me the time to kind of really build it out and talk about everything that needs to be discussed. So, tonight, if you're just tuning in, we are doing part one of the coming restoration of Israel, and we're going to be focused on the throne of David. I will say this. He's dragging this out. As I, I mean, I, it, it's crazy how long this has been dragged out to get to. He's not even really given us an introduction yet. It's just been dragged on. Uh, it's like, come on. Like, I hate to say, it, but I'm like, can we just, can you give me something so I can wrap up my review? I, I want people to go listen to this. So whenever you, if you go listen to part one of this, just remember you can skip now a good, I, I've done all the work for you. You can just skip all of this and you can just go right to the teaching. So maybe I've done a service for you. If you'll actually go listen to it, but man, it's like, come on. I, I want to have at least one thing that we can grab onto. All right. So let, let's see if we can get to that one thing. At the beginning of the broadcast, I started with Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Did you know? that your King James Bible has a main theme? Do you remember back in school, whether it was grade school, high school, or college, or beyond, and you had to write a, a thesis about something, and you had to talk about the main theme of your thesis? You know what the main theme of your Bible is? It is all about the coming king and the coming kingdom. That is the main theme of your Bible. Is the the main theme of your Bible the coming king and the coming kingdom? Do you think that's the main theme? Now, now again, this is one of those fun things about Christianity. If I was asked 10 Christians, what is the main theme of the Bible? I probably would get 30 different answers. So, but you you can write down what he thinks the main theme is. The main theme is the coming king and the coming kingdom. Um, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 11. And I want to, as we set the table for tonight's Bible study, I want to talk just very briefly about the fact that the Bible talks about Two restorations of the nation of Israel. 
There's not three. There's not four. There's not one. There are only two times in Scripture where the prophets talk about God regathering the people. Now, there's dozens and dozens, if not a hundred plus places where this subject is talked about. But just think about that, a hundred a hundred plus places in the Bible where this subject is talked about. See, that would be good to compile your own list, Right? And now if you, I, it would be, I don't think everyone would come up with the same number because I think some of the verses we'd be like, ah, I don't know if this really works, right? But it would be good to try to compile a list. That would be a lot of work. And, you know, maybe, maybe we need to do that someday. I don't know, but let's see. We're now going to get at least a a scripture. We're going to get an actual scripture here and do something with it. So we were going to finish this and then we'll be done. All right, here we go. There's only two times anywhere in the Bible, where Israel is being regathered. The first time, obviously, is after the Babylonian captivity. That's the first regathering. And keep your finger in Isaiah chapter 11 and turn to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Chapter 36. This is the last two verses in the Hebrew Bible. Second Chronicles 36, 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth had the Lord God of heaven given me, and he has charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. This is how the Hebrew Bible comes to an end, with the Jew being called back to Jerusalem. You want to know how the uh, King James Bible, Old Testament, ends? It ends in Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name the, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the soul, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold! I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The King James Bible Old Testament ends with a prophecy of the coming Messiah and the coming kingdom. The Hebrew Bible ends calling Jews to go back and rebuild the temple. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? So, the first time that the Jews were regathered, it was after the Babylonian captivity. The second time that the Jews will be regathered, we read about in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Isaiah 11 Verses 11 and 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time. If you have a paper Bible, underline this. That the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea, presumably Europe and America. Verse 12, 
and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, you might be tempted to say, that's May 14th, 1948. You may be tempted to say that, but before you do, let's read starting in verse 1 of the same chapter. Isaiah chapter. Okay, so his basic premise is that the the Second Chronicles was was the first regathering of, after the Babylonian captivity, and now in Isaiah eleven, he's now trying to show this is a this is a different regathering. It's not obviously coming out of Babylonian captivity, and it's not nineteen forty eight. It's a different one, right? And that sound of someone drinking that was not me, that was him. All right, we'll we'll let him at least make this argument here, and then we'll wrap up this review. Chapter 11, verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. This is Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. This is Isaiah 63, Revelation 19. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. What is Isaiah talking about? He's talking about the millennium. That is very obvious. Just know, depending on if you, in the way it works in Christianity, he says the millennium, other people will say this happens inside the church. He looks for a literal fulfillment, they will look for a spiritual fulfillment. That, that's just, that's why Christianity is so divided. No one agrees on anything, but okay, let, let's let him go. I'll let some at least make this argument about Isaiah 11. Verse 7. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Have you ever watched what a lion eats now? A lion eats raw red meat. That's what lions eat. But here, the lion has become a vegetarian. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp. That's a snake. And the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. That's a spider. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. This is why the next verse, the one that we started with, is not talking about May 14, 1948. None of those things that I just mentioned to you from Isaiah 11.1 1, all the way down to verse 10, none of those things have happened yet. And this is the context in which verse 11 sits. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. There is only two times, according to the Bible, that the nation of Israel is going to be officially regathered. Now, I am not denigrating May 14th, 1948. I am not putting it down or making light of that 
What happened on May 14th, 1948 is nothing short than of a miracle. It is the, the prophetic hand of God who put the Jewish people back in the nation of Israel in a stupendous and horrible and spectacular way. Do you realize without the Holocaust, the Jews would never have been put back in their land? There would have been no public sympathy for the Jew. There would have been no international outcry to give the Jewish people their own homeland. That was only made possible because the Holocaust happened. Now, the Bible says this, That makes me a little nervous. Are you saying, well, the Holocaust was horrible, but look, that's how they got the land. Or you could say God could have given them the land in 1948 without the Holocaust, right? Are you saying that's the only way God could have done it is have six million Jews exterminated so that there would be sympathy and a call for them to have their own land, their own nation? I think that... That's almost like trying to say, well, see, bad things happen, but good things come from it. Millions of people were murdered. And again, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the way that was stated. And I want you to think about this verse and I want you to tremble at this verse. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10. Isaiah 48, verse 10. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. You know what the number one most horrible thing about the concentration camps were? And I could give you a dozen horrible things about the concentration camps. But the one thing that everybody talks about over and over and over again is about all the Jews that got burned alive in the ovens at Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen and Ravensbrück and Treblinka and the pictures of those ovens with the, the charred ashes and charred bones of Jews piled high, that is really the number one defining iconic thing about the concentration camps was the ovens. I've been reading about it and watching documentaries about it most of my life, and I still can't wrap my head around it. I still can't imagine a nation, a modern nation, of presumably civilized people doing that to other people. I've been reading about these things since 1975, and I still can't wrap my head around what the Nazis did to the Jews during the Holocaust. And so when Isaiah says in 48.10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. That is how the Jewish people got regathered to the nation of Israel. But, turn to Matthew chapter 24, they were put back in the land on May 14th, 1948. I'm a little concerned with the use of 48. 10 because it uses the word furnace of affliction. Now is the furnace of affliction in Isaiah 48 is that not a reference to the Babylonian captivity or or maybe even the the affliction of Egypt? All right, now he's going to go to Matthew 24 which makes me really nervous. All right, it's going to Matthew 24. I I have oh right, this is not going anywhere close to the direction I thought this was going to go, but let's see what he does in Matthew 24. In order for these verses, which are not fulfilled as of yet, to be fulfilled. Matthew 24, verse 15. 
When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Go down to verse 20. But pray. Now, see, he's arguing that Matthew 24, 15, that this has not happened yet. And I will argue that a good portion of Matthew 24 was, it was about 70 AD, and a large portion of it was fulfilled in 70 AD. So, see, I, 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 may, I, see, I may even be in a disagreement with this part. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. If May 14, 1948 did not happen, if the Jewish people did not get put back into their homeland, then none of these verses in Matthew chapter 24 could properly be fulfilled. Oh, man. I don't know, don't know. I don't know about this. I believe Matthew 24, for the most part, look at the context of Matthew 24. He went back to put the context of Isaiah 11. And when Jesus went out and departed from the temple, Jesus is on earth. The temple is standing. His disciples came to him and showed him the buildings. And he, and he said unto them, see not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another. They shall not be, uh, that shall not be thrown down. And then they come to him and they were basically, hey, when is all this is going to happen? And he says, take heed that no man deceive you. And he begins to tell all of the signs pointing to 70 AD. Yeah, I, I have a hard time here with this. All right. Uh, yeah. So, okay, and then uh, ultimately, um, man, well, in AD 70, Titus destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple, and set up idols to mock the Jews. So, yeah, I mean, even the study Bible points to 70 AD. So, 70 AD, 70 AD, 70 AD. <sighs> okay. There would be no remnant to flee in Judea to Sela Petra. There would be no remnant to do all these things that Matthew talks about because they would be dispersed. So when you look at May 14th, 1948, and again, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just, as we set the table tonight, I just want you to understand that May 14th, 1948 was when the Jews were regathered to be scattered. And then at the second advent, when we return with King Jesus, as he brings in the kingdom, it is then and only then that the Jewish people are going to be finally and definitively regathered for the last time and they will never again be driven out of their land. If you want to say they were regathered to be scattered again, okay, that's 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 okay if that's your theory. I just don't think Matthew 24 is them being scattered again um, uh after uh, 1948, that 1948, that this is referring to something happening later. No, this is something that Matthew 24 is about 70 AD. 
for the most part. There are some of this that may, that may skip to something forward, but I think right there, that is referencing what happened in 70 AD. I, I, there's just no way to get around that if you're going to read Matthew 24 in any literal context in which it is given. They asked about the temple and he tells them what's going to lead to its destruction is what's happening in Matthew 24, 15. The destruction of the temple that was standing at the time, not the destruction of a temple that's going to be standing later. So I, I'm, I'm in complete disagreement with the way this is going, the way this is going. He's right in the middle of a sentence. I'm letting him finish the sentence and we will stop. At the second advent, when King Jesus sets up the kingdom, the Jewish people will be restored and they will never again be driven out. And with that, we have to take our first break of the night. We'll be right back after this. And we will stop right there for our conclusion, not our break. All right. We went 94 minutes. Oh, that was a wild and that was a long and winding road, but we got somewhere. Um, that is called Restoration of Israel, Part 1. It is from, again, let me give you the name of their program so you can find it on the Sermons 2.0 app and you can listen to it. It is called Now the End Begins Bible Study. We've listened to a good portion of it. We made it through a lot, right? We went through a lot. So there's about half of it left. If you can find, if you can fast forward and get to that first break, then you know exactly where it is. And then you can listen to the rest, all right? So uh, please go download it. Um, it doesn't appear anyone has downloaded it as of yet. So please go download it, okay? So, uh, or the numbers aren't working today, so that's a possibility. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if we'll do any more with it. But yeah, we, we spent a lot of time working on this. And uh, there you have it. The restoration of Israel. Uh, yeah. We had two goals. The goals were first to just tell you about it. Second goal was to do a little bit of review. We didn't get too far. I would argue, I disagree with his interpretation of Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is not about them being scattered at some later time. He's saying Matthew 24, that that section has never happened. Matthew 24 is referring to what happened in 70 AD for the most part of the chapter. And I'm not necessarily a fan of taking that verse in the book of Isaiah because it mentions furnace and somehow connecting that to the Holocaust. So I, 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 yeah, I'm a little concerned there. And I'm not a big fan of saying that, well, the only way God could get them back in the land was the Holocaust. I'm not a fan necessarily of that concept either. There was, there was a lot there that I wasn't necessarily prepared to hear, but okay, there we have it. Thanks for listening. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Everyone have a great day. I, I wish I had some like great thing to say here that we could like, oh, we ended with a very important point. We kind of ended with, well, where is this going? Well, there you go. That goes back to the first goal. Now you go listen to the rest. All right. God bless.